going to go ahead and get started. There are some folks still joining, so please excuse the um, the dings and the beeps as folks join. Um, I'm S.J. Howell. I'm the executive director of Montana Women Vote. I'm really excited and um, thrilled, honestly, to see so many of you joining us on this um, snowy Sunday afternoon. I want to just let folks know that we are recording um, these workshops and plenaries, so just keep that in mind. Um, and we are doing that so that we can make them available, the recordings to folks who may not be able to join in the moment or need to view them um, without internet access. Um, this is our opening plenary for our 2021 Women's Policy Leadership Institute. Um, today we're going to talk about 2021, the legislative session and beyond. We have a uh, a different, a really different WPLI this year, obviously, and so a pretty exciting week's worth of workshops. And we'll get into that a little bit in just a moment. But I want to, before we dive in, I want to just go over a few um, tech notes and reminders. Um, first of all, let me just say again, I'm grateful for all of you for joining us, and I'm grateful for our presenters who are going to share with us today. We really hope that um, despite not being able to be in person together this year, that the information that we can present um, will be useful in your, in your community and help us continue to build relationships and stay connected with one another as we do work to uh, make this state a better one for low income folks uh, across the state. So let's get into the tech notes. Um, everybody on should be muted automatically. Um, but if you have a question when we get to question and answer times, you can unmute yourself by pushing the little microphone icon on the bottom left part of your screen. If you're using a phone to join, you can unmute yourself by pushing star six. If you're accidentally unmuted and there's background noise going on, one of our hosts may mute you, but we do want to provide opportunities for folks to ask questions when we have time for question and answer um, during the first hour of the plenary and during small groups at the end. Um, we really do encourage you to ask questions of us and connect with other participants using the chat box. Um, you can submit questions for us into the chat at any time. And we will make sure that they um, are passed on to the panelists and that we'll try to answer as many questions as we can, given the time that we have. Um, there, we do also have closed captioning available. So if you want closed captioning on, um, it, you look down at, at your the bottom of your screen, you should have a, a button that says CC. And if you click on the arrow next to that, you can turn the closed captioning on or off and also adjust the size of the closed captioning. Um, if you have any questions or technical difficulties with any of that, again, you can use that chat box or you can call us directly at 406 317 1505 and we'll get that number in the chat box for you so if you need help and you need somebody to walk you through something give us a buzz um, please note that texting that phone number won't work so you'll need to call and we'll be happy to walk you through that again just want to reiterate that we are recording today's session so keep that in mind um, and recordings will be um, made available on our website along with materials that are used um, after the fact. So if you miss something, don't worry, we've got you covered. Um, and at the end of this workshop and all of our WPLI workshops this week, we're gonna have a brief online evaluation. And uh, part of that evaluation, there is an opportunity to put your name into a raffle for one of our conference prizes. 
Um, and every time you fill out that evaluation form for any of the workshops that you attend, um, that's one more entry into the raffle. So we, we do really um, appreciate the evaluations. We read them all, they're meaningful to us. So please do stick around and consider um, filling that evaluation out. All right, um, so here we are uh, at our opening WPLI plenary. It's very exciting. What we're gonna do today is spend the first hour um, sharing a little bit about Montana Women Vote and some of our 2021 priorities and what we're working on in the legislative session. And then we have two um, really fantastic presenters, Heather O'Loughlin from the Montana Budget and Policy Center, who's gonna talk to us about the state budget and tax and revenue policy. And Laura Terrell from Planned Parenthood's, Planned Parenthood of Montana, who's gonna talk to us about um, the landscape of reproductive rights this year. We are gonna have a little bit of time um, after Heather and Laura present for questions and at the very end of the first hour for questions. But again, put those questions into the chat. It's a great way to make sure they don't get forgotten. Um, and then the last half hour from 4 to 4.30 um, or thereabouts, we're hoping to have some small group breakouts. Um, you know, one of the really tough parts about moving WPLI to a virtual event is losing the chance to hang out and chit chat at tables and in small groups and get to know one another um, and hear what everyone is working on. So we're gonna do our best to provide some opportunity for small group discussion where everybody can hang out and talk a little bit. Um, we know that small group breakouts on Zoom aren't for everybody. So it is optional. And if you wanna leave at the end of the first hour and not join the breakouts, that's totally okay. We understand. But if you do wanna join, what we're gonna try and do is split those breakouts by issue areas. So we're gonna have the issues put into the chat now. And what would be really great is in a minute, I'm gonna ask folks to write a little intro about yourself, just very brief name, pronouns, where you're the city that you're uh, joining us from in the chat. And I'd also like you to consider choosing one of the issue areas that we list as an option for a breakout and putting that in the chat as well. And that way during the next hour, our tech support folks can sort people out into those breakouts and be ready to go at four o'clock. So again, I'm gonna ask you to choose from one of six issue areas that you'd like to discuss in your small group and put that into um, the chat. And we will then use that to split up our breakouts by issue area. So those issues are healthcare, racial and indigenous justice, criminal justice reform, LGBTQ rights, tax and budget policy, and voting rights. If you know for sure that you can't stay past four o'clock and you don't wanna join a small group, you can also just put none in your intro. And that again, helps us with our, our behind the scenes sorting during the next hour. So um, if folks can, on the right hand of your screen, you should see that chat box. If you don't see it yet at the bottom, you'll see a little text bubble that says chat. You hit that and it'll pop up on your right. And if folks are willing, we'd love to have everyone just type in your name, your pronouns, and where you're joining us from, and then choose one of those breakout options and list that as well. All right, while folks are doing that, I'm gonna just run through a couple quick other um, housekeeping bits. Um, if you registered with us um, before last week, we did mail out packets and those packets have um, a program with the agenda for the week. They also have um, a flyer on how to, um, how to join and engage in the legislature remotely. We are gonna talk 
um, a fair amount about that on our Tuesday afternoon workshop. Um, but just in case you can't make that, there's a, a nice handout of how you can give remote testimony, stream committee hearings, and other things. There's also a land acknowledgement map. Normally, when we gather in one place, we like to acknowledge the, the land that we are gathering on um, and acknowledge that for any of us who aren't indigenous, that we are settlers on that land. Today, of course, we're joining from all over the state and in fact, outside the state. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at that map. Um, we're also going to put a link in the chat where uh, to a really great website where you can find um, what indigenous land you're on from anywhere in the country. And we encourage folks to take a minute and find out what indigenous land you're joining us from today and uh, take a minute to acknowledge that land. Also, we think that Acknowledging is a good step, but it's only the first step. And so at Montana Women Vote, we also um, this year have made a donation to the Hel Helena Indian Alliance as a way to um, more concretely acknowledge the benefits we have from, um, from, from gathering virtually this year on this land. And in your packet, there are a couple different options. Uh, links for places that you too could consider making a donation if you'd like. I want to take just a moment to run through our schedule for the week. Um, we have some really exciting panels and workshops coming up, and I would encourage folks to join as many as you'd like, or all of them. Um, tomorrow, Monday, we have a panel on Black and Indigenous issues in Montana from 5.15 to 6.30. Tuesday, we're going to go through uh, navigating the legislature, again, from 5.15 to 6.30. Wednesday, we have two workshops, um, healthcare policy in, Monta in Montana from noon to 1.30, and Rethinking Justice, Criminal Legal Reform in Montana from 5.15 to 6.30. Um, Thursday, we have Cultural Strategy, Art, Storytelling, and Cultural Change from 5.15 to 6.30. And Saturday, How to Run for Office from 1 to 2 p.m. and Telling Your Story from 2 to 3 p.m. So I know I went through those pretty quickly. They're all on our website, montanawomenvote.org, that has the whole um, agenda listed out as well as the Zoom links. So if you need more information or want to find any of the resources that we're referring to, head over there to our website. Um, I think that the last thing that I want to do in this opening is thank our sponsors, because even with virtual WPLI, we really couldn't have done it without the amazing support of our sponsors. So big thanks to Montana Budget and Policy Center, Montana Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, Forward Montana, Montana Racial Equity Project, Montana Human Rights Network, We Are Montana, and the Women's Foundation of Montana. All right, well, that is our long <laughs> uh, opening, plenary opening. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Ella to talk a little bit about Montana Women Vote and WPLA. Thanks, Howell, for going through all of that with us. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, just a brief reminder, again, that you can give us a call if you're having any issues at 406-317-1505, or we have staff that are keeping an eye on the chat. If you have any, um, any other problems, you can direct message Rachel Pauli or Amber, uh, Amber Rodriguez, and they will help you out, or you can just send a chat to everybody, and we'll make sure to message you back and help with whatever you need. Um, we're super excited to be kicking off WPLI this year. This is our 15th annual Women's Policy Leadership Institute, which is very exciting um, and first ever online. Um, 
the Women's Policy Leadership Institute, or WPLI, as we often refer to it, was created by Montana Women Vote staff years ago to build a space where low-income folks and their families and their allies could come together to learn, build relationships, build community with each other, and take action together um, every year. Um, and as you notice, this year and every year we hold it in February so that it coincides with the legislative session where a lot of important policy actions happen. Um, especially policies that affect low-income folks. So it's been one of our favorite things that we do at Montana Women Vote every year. Um, and that's because it's a chance for us to meet new people and learn about the amazing work that's happening in communities across the state and strengthen our skills and experience and work together with other people to collectively build power and strengthen our skills and experience together to make change in Montana. As Howell mentioned, it's obviously really different this year for a lot of reasons, particularly the being online part of it, but we're really excited to share some time with you all over the next week. If you're a little bit newer to Montana Women Vote, uh, just a little bit of information about us as an organization. We were founded just over 20 years ago as a voter registration project. And it's actually a pretty cool story how a bunch of organizers got together. They saw that a lot of the voter registration work that was geared towards low-income folks in Montana was really not, uh, the outcomes weren't bearing out for women in the same way that they were bearing out for men. Um, and so they decided that they wanted to address that need and create a space that was specifically tailored toward low-income women and families and those particular needs that are experienced in those communities especially as relates to voting. And then we've sort of grown a lot and moved into a policy space. So they saw a need and they made it happen. And all these years later, we're an organization with six staff and a practicum student doing policy work and community organizing and leadership development in Montana. So it's really exciting to have been able to grow together as an organization um, and stick around for so many years. And I hope that there are 20 more plus to come in the future. So I want to just take a moment to introduce some of our staff. So if you're on staff and you wouldn't mind um, having your camera on and being ready to just give us a wave. Um, as you heard at the beginning of the session today, we have S.J. Howell, our illustrious leader and executive director. I'm going to get in trouble for that later. Um, <laughs> Kylie Gursky, our Deputy Director. Myself, Ella Smith, our Program Director. Hi. <laughs> um, Danny Vasquez, our Community Organizer. Iku Beck, another Community Organizer. Uh, DV Cole, another Community Organizer. And Amber Rodriguez, our practicum student from the University of Montana. Sometimes with the backgrounds, your hand can get lost. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Iku, Danny, DV, Howell, and Kylie. Um, any of us, you can feel free to send a message to throughout uh, if you want to direct chat us with anything. And if we can't get back to you in the moment, we'll make sure to get back to you as soon as we can. We're doing our very best to make this as accessible as possible. So if you run into any issues, please don't hesitate to contact us. So now I just wanna talk a little bit before we get into our, our more um, fascinating content of the day. I would love to learn a little bit about who's in the room today. We've actually had over 350 people register for WPLI so far, and we have 75 people joining us today um, as of now. Hopefully that could grow and we anticipate that folks will be able to attend some and not all of the sessions um, depending on your various schedules. But it's exciting to see so much interest in this event and it's an amazing group of people and we have so much to learn from one another this year. I encourage you to take a look at the chat box, send a private chat to other people that you would like to connect with um, please, if you are going to private chat with people, remember to be respectful. Um, this is a space that holds a lot of different experiences, and we just want to make sure that we're approaching each other with respect and care at all times. Um, and 
stick around for the breakouts at the end of the plenary. It's one of the ways that we're hoping to include that community building of piece of WPLI that we love so much. And the last thing that I'll mention is if you do know how to rename yourself um, in your in the participants tab in Zoom and you're really interested in connecting with people in your area, you might consider putting your city in with your name um, in the participants tab. If you don't know how to do that, don't worry about it. We'll help you connect with other folks in other ways if you if you would like to. But if you include your city, it might help people who are also in your area to be able to connect with you. So feel free to do that as well. So now before I turn it back over to Howell, we're gonna just do a quick poll. So if you're on the phone, I apologize, um, but I'll try to verbally share some of the results here of this poll. Um, but for those of you who are on your computers, we would love to just learn a little bit about who is joining us today. So have you been to WPLI before? If so, how many times? Is this gonna be your first time, your second time? Have you been here five or more times? You just can't get enough of the content that we provide every year. Um, what activities have you participated in? So this is just wanting us to learn a little bit about, about some of the um, issue related activities that folks may have played a part in in the past. If you've made a call or sent a message to an elected official, if you've written a letter to the editor, helped someone register to vote, visited the Capitol in Helena during the legislative session, not always fun. Um, if you've attended a phone bank, if you've shared your story or spoken publicly. Um, and finally, what are you working on and what issues do you see impacting your family or your community? Healthcare, including Medicaid, CHIP, Healthy Montana Kids, also especially including reproductive healthcare and access to abortion cuts to safety net programs like SNAP and TANF, affordable housing, racial and indigenous justice, criminalization of poverty or criminal. Sorry folks, I just had a little bit of an audio issue there. I hope this is gonna work okay. Um, criminalization of poverty or criminal justice reform and LGBTQ or two-spirit rights. And if there are other issues that weren't represented here and you wanna drop them in the chat, you can feel free to do so. So now I'm gonna give everybody just another minute and then I'm gonna share the results of the poll so that we can all get a little bit of a snapshot of who's in the room. And while I let folks respond to the poll, if you are interested in sharing about WPLI on your social media, or if you're interested in inviting folks who maybe aren't registered, we would be absolutely happy and thrilled to have anybody participate. Um, at some point, we will share in the chat box the link to the full detailed agenda online that includes all of the Zoom links and registration is not required for attendance. It just helps us communicate with you better. So absolutely feel free to share this event um, on social or with individual folks. And now it's looking like very excitingly that a lot of people um, are here for the first time this year. And I think one of the upsides to being able to provide the Women's Policy Leadership Institute online is a lot of folks who aren't able to make it in Helena in person can participate fully this year from wherever they are, which is very exciting. We got some second timers, uh, some third timers, also fourth timers, and a couple folks, five people who have been here five or more times, which is incredibly exciting. Um, a lot of people here, 92% have made a phone call. Lots of folks have written letters to the editor or helped someone register to vote. A few of us, uh, just under 50% have visited the Capitol in Helena during a legislative session. Lots of us have phone banked before and about 40% have shared our story publicly or um, spoken publicly, which is all super exciting. And these are some of the things that we'll be talking about moving forward. 
And it looks like a lot of these issues that were involved or that we're discussing over the agenda of this event uh, are really resonating with folks. Over 50% selected everything that we, all of the options that we listed. And I'm seeing a lot of um, mentions in the chat of environmental justice, environmental policy, things like climate change, the ways that environmental um, issues affect communities of color. And um, that's something that affects many of our communities very strongly. So food sovereignty, lots of other good issues being dropped in the chat. And please, um, please continue to participate in that chat to the degree that you would like to do so. So thank you so much. I'll share the results of the chat for just a minute so folks can look over it. And I will turn it back over to Howell to talk a little bit about our priorities in 2021. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ella. Um, so excited to dig into some issues here. And I'm going to move fairly quickly through some of these because I want to give enough time for Heather and Laura, who are going to do more substantial presentations. But obviously, I think everyone on this on this plenary knows 2021 is um, a year and a legislative session unlike what we have seen in the recent past. Um, you know, we've seen a shift in political landscape in the state that means a lot of our work this year, especially in the legislature, is um, focused on defensive work and defending some of the rights and um, programs that we have fought so hard for over the last few decades. So I'm gonna run fairly quickly through some of our top legislative priorities. I'll note that there's gonna be a chance to dig into some of these in the small group breakouts. So if one of them catches your attention, um, consider staying for those for those small group discussions. Um, first, you know, protecting and maintaining Montana's Medicaid expansion program. This has been a top issue of ours for, um, well, quite some time now, almost a decade. So far, we're not seeing a lot of direct attacks on, on Medicaid expansion in legislation form, um, but that could change at any point. And we are seeing efforts that will sort of nibble around the edges at eligibility, um, putting barriers in place to access and enrollment. And one bill I wanna highlight in particular is Senate Bill 100, which is a so-called, and for folks on the phone, I'm using air quotes here, welfare fraud prevention bill. And this is a bill that would make it um, much more difficult to enroll and stay enrolled in Medicaid and many other safety net programs. So that, that's a bill that we're fighting. We've been highlighting it in our legislative updates and we'll continue to do so. Um, another top priority is um, advancing policies that raise revenue and promote tax fairness and defending against policies that do the opposite. And I'm going to leave that one for Heather because she's got um, a lot more good information and detail. But uh, and and she will highlight a couple bills coming up soon that will really move us away from tax fairness and that we could use everyone's help in defeating. Um, going right along with revenue and tax fairness is defending against state budget cuts and particularly those cuts to crucial safety net programs and to our state Department of Public Health and Human Services, which manages um, and implements those programs. Um, another legislative priority this year is standing up for the rights, the privacy and the dignity of uh, LGBTQ Montanans, and particularly the trans, non-binary, and two-spirit communities. Folks maybe have seen that we started this session off, I mean, week two of the session right at the beginning, with attacks on the trans, non-binary, and two-spirit communities. Um, two bills, House Bill 112, um, which would prohibit trans youth from um, participating in um, high school and college sports. That bill passed the House and is headed to the Senate. 
And House Bill 113, which would prohibit trans youth from accessing gender affirming health care, which um, was defeated in the House thanks to um, an incredible amount of work from a big group of advocates and ordinary Montanans. Um, we're also expecting a couple other attacks um, that haven't yet been introduced, probably a Religious Freedom Restoration Act type of bill, which would legalize discrimination in the name of, of quote unquote, religious freedom. And we will be moving one proactive bill, the Montana Human Rights Act, um, which would include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression into our statewide non-discrimination law. That bill has also not been introduced yet, so keep your eyes peeled for those. Um, another policy to highlight is uh, working to advance racial justice and indigenous justice, both through policy and through access to the legislature and lifting up the voices of Black, Indigenous, and people of color within legislative spaces. I do want to highlight just a, a handful of bills under this um, legislative priority bucket. There's a lot. Um, there are a handful of bills that address the missing and murdered Indigenous people crisis. House Bill 35, House Bill 36, and House Bill 98 are all bills that would continue and expand and build on the really good work that was started last legislative session around statewide programs to address the missing and murdered Indigenous people um, crisis in the state. Those bills have all passed the House, um, mostly unanimously, which is really wonderful to see, and they are headed to the Senate. Um, there are two bills that would um, create Indigenous Peoples Day, um, Senate Bill 94 and Senate Bill 146. Those are both being, both being heard this Wednesday. So um, if you're looking for a way to engage this week, you can send your representatives messages in support of those bills um, and um, keep your eyes peeled. We'll have more information from those on our, on our website and social media channels. There's also, of course, um, some attacks, particularly on tribal sovereignty that are moving this session. Um, I want to highlight two that are um, particularly concerning and sort of moving right now. Senate Bill 138. Um, this is an attack on um, tribal tax policy. And I won't go into the details here. It's just a little bit more complicated than we have time for at this moment. Um, but that was a bill heard in Senate Tax Committee last week that we would like to um, be able to kill before it moves any further. And then House Bill 241, um, this is a bill that would allow non-tribal members hunting rights access on tribal land. It would change the structure for that. And of course, that's just a direct attack on, on sovereignty. And that's being heard tomorrow afternoon in House Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. So again, um, I know that's a lot of bill numbers. Happy to get those into the chat um, and continue on making sure folks have access to send legislators messages on those. Um, the last two things I want to mention, and then I'm going to kick it over to Heather. Um, we are working on working to, to dismantle the criminalization of poverty and work for progressive criminal justice reform. That work continues. There are quite a lot of bills moving and um, we have, again, a small group chat today and a panel Wednesday afternoon uh, evening to dig into that issue. Um, and then, of course, defending access to the ballot and um, fighting attacks on voter rights. And here I'll just mention House Bill 176, which would end same-day voter registration. Folks may have seen there was a little bit of drama with this bill. It was tabled in committee and then untabled after pressure from the governor. 
um, and it has passed the House and is headed to the Senate. So this is really a bill that um, we need to focus our attention on and, and try and get it killed. So obviously a lot going on, a lot of moving parts, a lot of priorities. Um, again, we're gonna talk in depth about a couple of those right now, a couple uh, at four o'clock in small groups, and then almost all of these throughout the week. So we do hope you'll be able to join for some more of those conversations. But in the meantime, I want to move us on to hearing from our presenters um, who are able to spend a little bit more time digging into um, the state budget and tax policy and reproductive rights and health care on the other on respective respectively so whew, uh, let me just introduce to you heather o'loughlin a co-director uh, from montana budget and policy center a longtime friend of montana women vote and i think our state's expert on um, the state budget i'm going to take a moment to pull up some uh, slides, and then Heather, you can take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Howell, and um, the whole team at Montana Women Vote. Uh, WPLI is, I think, my favorite event during session, um, and I'm sad that we all can't be together in person, but it is really nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, so Howell and the Montana Women Vote team, I think, wanted me to go through just sort of the the, the budget process generally and, and what we're seeing so far this legislative session. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the tax measures that, that Hal mentioned um, earlier. So if you go to the first slide, so um, just a couple like big picture overview of, of what, what our state budget looks like. Um, so this is um, the last biennium budget. Uh, so the biennium comprises two years. Um, so because our legislative session meets every other year, when we when we pass a budget is for a two year period. Um, and you can see that Montana's budget um, is a pretty significant amount is federal funds. About almost half of our budget is federal dollars. Um, a lot of that is Medicaid funding. Um, so when the state um, the state provides a state match for Medicaid programs, but we receive a significant amount of federal Medicaid dollars. So a big a big portion of that is Medicaid, but it also includes things like highway federal highway funding as well. Um, the general fund, the green portion, that is what we often talk about as the main piece of the budget that legislators are discussing and deciding how it will appropriate general fund dollars. Um, so there isn't a particular purpose uh, and it is ultimately up to the legislature to appropriate that money for particular uses. And then the other piece is state special revenue, which is um, different than general funds. It is state, it is state dollars, but it is for a particular purpose. So you can think about this as like, the, the tobacco tax or cigarette tax, a portion of that is designated for um, healthcare, healthcare services. So that's through a state special revenue account. So the next, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what makes up our budget. And I'm gonna first start with the general fund dollars. So if you just look at our general fund, this again is over a two year period it's about $4 billion um, that is included in the main budget bill. And you can see that about half of that is education funding. So that includes K-12 um, funding to our K-12 public schools, as well as um, the funding that goes to the Montana University system. About a quarter of our budget, our general fund budget is health and human service funding. So the next slide, This is House Bill 2 all funds. So this includes the federal dollars as well. And you can see the, the total amount now when you factor in federal funds and state special funds is $10 billion over that two year period. And you can see now that Health and Human Services makes up the biggest piece of the pie. Um, 
that is, again, largely a result of the federal Medicaid funds that we receive that are matched by state, that by state dollars. So now let's move to the next slide. So I think it's just important to mention, um, many of you have been um, through WPLI in the past or been engaged in legislative sessions um, in, in past sessions. So many of you will remember that um, the state went through a very difficult budget session uh, a couple sessions ago. So in 2017, um, Montana faced a reduction in, ta in tax revenue that was coming into the state, and that resulted in very deep budget cuts. Um, those cuts were taken during regular legislative session in 17, and then there was also a special session where even further cuts were made. Many of those cuts were taken in health and human services. Um, so in addition to cutting state dollars, we lost a lot of those federal funds for Medicaid programs. So cuts to mental health services, um, the closure of many rural offices of public assistance where folks can go to access services and public benefits um, and, and cut to higher education and K-12 as well. So if you go to the next slide, and I'll just say um, the two, in 2018, some of those funds were restored to agencies, but I think what we continue to hear and what you probably all um, are experiencing or, or have heard that, you know, in many, in many areas of the state, um, we have not seen a full restoration of services that were in place prior to 2017. So a lot of folks still struggling to access services wait lists for home and community-based services, um, the closure of mental health um, centers and um, or the reduction of services in some communities, and many of those services have not been built back up. So this is a little slide that we have on the process of, the, of how the legislature builds the budget. And this really starts before legislative session. Um, the governor proposes a budget in mid-November um, we have noted here, we added uh, a, a, a bullet here that um, Governor Gianforte then as the new governor also made recommended changes to the budget. So we'll talk a little bit about how his budget, his proposed budget compared to what Governor Bullock had proposed. And then legislative session starts and the, the lion's share of the budget process really at the beginning of session is, is conducted in these subcommittees. So um, the subcommittees are comprised of both Senate and House legislators, and they're broken up into different um, par parts of the budget. Um, so there is a subcommittee that focuses on the natural resource agencies and Department of Transportation. There's a subcommittee that focuses on K-12 education and higher education, sort of the education agencies. Um, there is a subcommittee that is devoted entirely to the Department of Public Health and Human Services. It's the largest agency that the state has, um, and that subcommittee focuses its attention entirely on that one department. So those meetings are happening right now. Um, they hear from the agencies, they take public comment from um, providers or individuals who are impacted by the budget, um, and they conduct these hearings over the course of about a month and a half. And so if you're interested in a particular piece of the state budget, you want to know what is happening with this department or this particular program, you can go and see which subcommittee has jurisdiction over that agency. And those are really um, the, the legislators that are, that are that are digging into the details of that budget. So I always really emphasize that those are the legislators that are meant to be really the experts in that piece of the budget. And really an important, they're, they're the key folks if you're looking at, um, I want you know I want to push for an increase of, of an investment in a particular program. Those are really the subcommittee members are the ones that are really gonna be focused on it. So from there, um, after the subcommittees take action in mid-February, um, the, the budget bill, House Bill 2, is put all together, and then it's heard by the full House Appropriations Committee. Um, after they take action, it then goes to the House floor, 
and then it moves over to the Senate and they have a hearing and the full financing claims and then it goes to the Senate floor. So it kind of follows the same process in the Senate. In each of these points, the legislature can make changes. So um, certainly I, I think we expect that the full appropriations may make changes from what the subcommittee had. And we've also seen in past years where the financing claims and the Senate also makes changes. Um, so at that point, the legislature can conference, um, can uh, organize a conference committee to work out the differences, or the House can accept the Senate changes. So um, that's kind of the budget process in a nutshell. We're really in those subcommittee hearings right now. So next slide. So just a little bit of overview of um, the, the governor's budget. So Governor Bullock, again, um, released a proposed budget in mid-November that's required by law. Um, as the new governor, Governor Gianforte, then made uh, recommended changes uh, from that from that budget. I think the one thing that we were um, that we were pleased to see was that Governor Gianforte's proposed budget largely reflects Bullock's budget. Um, there are not huge deep cuts um, to programs. And in fact, most of the um, inflationary adjustments or adjustments that are needed to maintain services into the next uh, into the next biennium were included in, in Gianforte's budget. So that was good po positive news. Um, there are a couple things that that are different. And so overall, his budget reflects about a hundred million dollars less in expenditures. Um, a couple big things that he has proposed is increased vacancy savings rate amongst all the agencies. So this is essentially requiring each agency to hold open a certain number of state employee positions vacant for a period of time in order to reach those savings. Um, so that certainly is concerning, um, particularly as we saw cuts in past sessions that uh, eliminated a number of state employee positions. Um, so I think that's something that the subcommittees are, are really digging into. What, what does that vacancy savings mean across these agencies? The Governor, Governor Gianforte's bill, uh, budget also did eliminate some new spending proposals that were included in, in Bullock's uh, budget. I think the two big ones are was a proposed investment in early childhood education um, this is funding that had previously been uh, appropriated. Um, that funding went away in the last legislative session, and he had proposed uh, $10 million over the biennium for early childhood education. Jean Forte pulled that out of his budget. And uh, the, other, the other kind of big new proposal was um, funding for need-based aid, um, which also um, is not included in Jean Forte's budget. There are some smaller reductions to, uh, to some of the agencies. Again, not, not dramatic changes, but um, things that the subcommittees are now looking at, um, particularly around the Office of Public Defender um, reductions um, there, some reductions to the Department of Correction proposals, and then uh, a slight reduction to the inflationary adjustment for the university system. There are some new proposals, um, which I won't get into here, um, but he has proposed um, utilizing some of the um, recreational marijuana um, funding for new um, uh, substance use disorder treatment um, to match for some additional federal dollars. And there is a proposal for some new, a new program for K-12 teacher recruitment. Um, so I will actually, I'll tackle the, um, the tax cuts in the next, I think I've got a separate slide on that, so we can keep going. So just really quick on the subcommittees, um, uh, there's been some press around um, the actions that, want, that the subcommittee that is in charge of the Department of Public Health and Human Services took. It is a little bit wonky, um, but in effect, um, the, the subcommittee took action right at the start of the subcommittee process to drop DPHHS's budget down from what they would previously had used for the base to build the next biennium budget down to the 2019 actuals. 
The effect of this is not totally clear at this point, um, but I've provided just a little bit of detail on how much that is. It is a, a considerable reduction to DPHHS's budget um, to start this process. Now they could rebuild that back up and then build from there, um, but that has not been really made very clear. Um, so I think many in the health world are, are concerned about what this might mean um, and have been talking to the subcommittee about the importance of not just rebuilding back to 2021 base, but um, investing additional resources into these programs. So next slide. So just real quick on the tax proposal. So, um, you know, Gianforte talked it before the election about um, wanting to slow the growth in the budget. Um, as I mentioned, you know, he, he has proposed some reductions or cuts in the budget um, and is turning around and also proposing pretty considerable tax cuts. Uh, so I've included here the four main bills that we are going to see, and actually all four of these bills are, are going to be heard by committees this upcoming week. Uh, the first one, Senate Bill 159, proposes cutting income taxes. It would cut the top income tax bracket in Montana from 6.9% to 6.75%. So that doesn't seem like a big change, um, but it will cost the state roughly $30 million a year in lost revenue. It's a significant reduction in revenue, and the lion's share of that benefit will go to wealthy households. So we have a progressive tax income tax, and so when you cut the top tax rate, those with more income will see a bigger tax cut. So about 80% of the tax cut will go to the wealthiest 20% of households in Montana. So it is a largely a benefit for very high income households. Those and middle incomes um, on average will receive about 10 to $15 in a tax cut. So um, it's a pretty, those up at the top will see an average tax cut of about $1,300 annually. So that's the big one we're, we're focused on this week. Um, there, he has uh, two, other, two other bills here, House, Senate Bill 184 and House Bill 303, which are largely targeted to business. Um, so it would cut taxes on certain um, capital gains or if you're selling stock or releasing uh, or selling a business. Um, he also has a proposal to cut business equipment tax. So, those two both will have a hit to the general fund, a reduction in revenue and largely benefiting large, big, bigger businesses. And then the fourth one, um, Senate Bill 182 is also very concerning. Um, it is not proposing tax cuts today, but it essentially says if we see revenue come in in future years above a certain growth rate, it will automatically trigger further cuts to income taxes. Um, again, reducing that top tax bracket. So this one is very concerning to us. We've seen this in other states. Um, it, it, it can play, uh, it can uh, really hamstring future legislatures and in making investments in the future. Um, and in many instances, we see that these triggered tax cuts occur and you hit a recession or a dip in, in revenue like we saw in 2016 and you don't have the revenue then at that point to, um, to, to rebuild the budget. So um, very concerning and um, you know, certainly stay in touch and with Howell and Montana Women Vote Team, um, we'll be getting talking points out. And I think these are four bills that are um, certainly worth folks' attention and um, urging legislators to, to oppose them. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, and happy to take any questions folks have. Thank you so much, Heather. So if folks have questions, we're actually gonna um, 
jump right into Laura's presentation and then take all the questions at the end. Um, sorry for that last minute change. We want to make sure folks get a chance to hear from Laura. But do put those questions in the chat or hang on to them because Heather's going to be around and we will have time for questions in just a moment. Um, so I do want to introduce Laura Terrell with Planned Parenthood of Montana, um, another great friend of Montana Women Vote who's going to talk a little bit about um, the attacks on reproductive rights and access to reproductive health care. Um, so I'm going to take one second and get her slides up. Please stand by. Okay, Laura, take it away. Great, thanks, Howell. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, it, uh, sorry, we can't be together, uh, and I appreciate Montana Women Vote pulling us together in a virtual space. Uh, there's a lot of darkness in the Capitol right now, so making sure that we check in with our communities um, in these kinds of spaces is more important than ever. So thank you for having me. Uh, Laura Terrell, she, her. Uh, I serve as the Vice President of External Affairs for Planned Parenthood of Montana, which is our healthcare delivery organization, and then our advocacy arm is Planned Parenthood Advocates of Montana, uh, which is how I am uh, showing up today. Um, obviously, you know, with with Montana Women Votes, you know, mission of of dissecting and 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 exploring how policy impacts low income uh, uh, folks and families. Um, there's no better example of of that intersection uh, than than the economic uh, policies that that uh, budget and revenue policies that Heather was just talking about, and then obviously reproductive rights. Um, there's no greater indicator uh, of, a, of a person's ability to succeed financially than the ability to determine um, when and if to have a family uh, and the attacks on um, that decision making, that individual personal freedom, uh, ability to make those decisions in private without government interference are, are greatly under attack uh, this legislative session. Um, would love to uplift uh, two quick things before I dive into the bulk of my presentation. One is um, I wanna own that there are three ways to approach uh, uh, reproductive freedom. Um, the th the, and those three frameworks are uh, reproductive health care, which is, uh, you know, centers on, on the delivery of health care, which we do on the C3 side. And then reproductive rights, which is what, um, you know, Planned Parenthood about Advocates of Montana does, which is about uh, changing the laws and, and um, impacting who is elected to make those decisions and, and out, you know, and the outcomes of elections and, and the impact that has on legislation. And the third bucket is reproductive justice. And reproductive justice, as anyone that attended uh, the fabulous WPLI conference uh, last session knows, is about the dismantling of structures that impede people's ability, particularly uh, Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color's ability to succeed. And uh, reproductive justice is about breaking down those, those systems and rebuilding them um, in just ways. And, and to reach full equity and justice. And um, I wanna own that Planned Parenthood is not a reproductive justice organization. Um, we support those who, who do uh, in a myriad of ways, uh, but we do not feel like it's our uh, right or, or um, uh, it's not good for us to step into those spaces. Uh, rather, we want to play a behind the scenes role and uplift voices that, that do work in that space. So I will be coming at, uh, coming um, uh, today with that reproductive rights uh, framework. So as we've talked about, uh, bodily autonomy is critically important um, and uh, uh, lots of uh, attacks this session. Howell, if you will take us to the next slide, please. Great. So uh, you are the reason for doing this work. Your voice matters more than anyone else's. And uh, we'll talk at the end about, you know, how to stay, you know, if you, if you aren't already engaged, um, uh, you know, with, with Planned Parenthood or any of these organizations that you see listed here, you know, we'll tell you how to do that. 
but what's important to know is that, you know, of course, democracy hinges on, on your, um, your engagement in, in your legislative process and in your local governments. And then um, as part of the Montana Reproductive Rights Coalition, your voice is being amplified by the incredible organizations that you see listed here, many of whom are on the call today, which is awesome. Um, and you know, we, we do recognize at Planned Parenthood that our um, patients lead intersectional lives and need more than just access to quality healthcare. They also need access to the voting booth and, and to live in communities free from violence and quality affordable education. Um, and so, you know, many of the policies, uh, in fact, I think maybe all of the policies that Heather and uh, Howell have mentioned are things that Planned Parenthood is engaged in as well. Obviously, I'll be focused uh, directly on repro today. Um, next slide, please. So we are not a uh, in the minority here by any means to think that you know having control over our bodies and the ability to make private health care decisions in consultation uh, with our faith our family and our medical provider a full 77 percent of the american public oppose overturning uh, roe v wade the um, landmark supreme court decision uh, in 1973 that gives us a uh, the right to um, uh, make private health care decisions um, Abortion is safe and legal in this country uh, and, and remains as such uh, in Montana. Um, and I wanna point out that a majority of Montanans uh, also uh, believe that, that you know, access to the full range of reproductive health care, including abortion, uh, should remain safe and legal. Uh, we have a constitutional right to that. And although uh, folks seeking an abortion shouldn't have to um, justify their reasons, um, for, for obtaining one, uh, what we're seeing, the attacks are becoming, uh, particularly here in Montana, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, uh, later in pregnancy when families need to elect to have an abortion, it's often under rare and heartbreaking circumstances and need, and they need every medical option available to them, uh, potentially to, you know, save the life of the mother, um, or to prevent, uh, you know, additional upheaval, um, in their lives. Uh, next slide, please. So just wanted to uplift really quickly about uh, an overview about who abortion patients are in this country. And what's important here to understand as y'all look at this data is that, as we all know, so often, you know, the way that we can, um, you know, a government's reflection of, of their values and how they value people is um, predicated on the policies imposed on low income people and those with, who already face you know, barriers to accessing healthcare, education, you know, uh, clean environment. So there, you know, when we look at attacks on low income folks, generally, we get a sense of where government is, is trying to go. And um, abortion, uh, you know, abortion politics and abortion policy is, is um, you know, unfortunately, a, a really great example of that. Uh, the folks that are per, um, pursuing uh, anti-reproductive health care policies in Montana um, are absolutely trying to shame uh, uh, folks who, who are pursuing abortion and further stigmatizing um, health care. Abortion is health care and uh, uh, no other uh, uh, health care policy is, is as hotly debated um, as abortion and not, not be. Um, what we know is that um, folks, uh, you know, who need abortion and, and these attacks on abortion, abortion doesn't go away. It just becomes more unsafe. Um, and I am speaking as a woman uh, from two generations of family of matriarchs in my family uh, needed to self-abort pre-row and both of them almost died. Um, this is not hyperbole, right? I, you know, I, um, I know you all, uh, you know, have heard stories and, and um, I'm here uh, because someone didn't die uh, trying to self-abort. And, and so I, um, you know, think about my mom and my grandma um, on the daily and my daughters too, and all of us, um, uh, it's controlling. Um, 
So uh, the last thing I want to say here is not only, you know, is, is are these policy attacks a good indication of, of government interference, but also um, the ability to pay. Because safe and legal abortion doesn't mean anything if folks don't have the ability to pay for it. Um, and, and we're seeing um, those kinds of attacks, you know, attacks on, on access to public uh, health programs uh, this session also. So without further ado, Howell, the next slide, please. Great. So there are um, two stripes on the page. I'm not sure where those came from, but welcome, uh, pink stripes. Oh, ta-da! Uh, there's some voodoo happening back there. Um, so there are so many bills that I decided to uh, break them up into categories. You know, obviously we're happy to provide a full list, um, but I um, what I because and the reason I decided to categorize them is that the bills that we're seeing this session are part of a national trend. The, the folks in Montana who are pursuing these policies, these anti-reproductive health care legislators are not um, unique, right? These are, these are pages out of a playbook, a national playbook to outlaw abortion. And states are vying to be the case that's, you know, going to trigger the, you know, ultimate review at Roe. And it's like this, you know, strange white dude contest um, to see who can, you know, get the, the um, case in front of the Supreme Court to ultimately overturn Roe. So a um, little bit different of approach here, and I'm happy to answer questions or, you know, get into, you know, policy detail. But as you'll see here um, in the 21 session, there are uh, strangely 21, um, at least 21 anti-reproductive health care bills that have been filed. Um, about 45% of those are actively moving and a majority of them are represented um, on this page. So attacks on patients, um, uh, that's the access to uh, uh, public health plans. Uh, um, representative, she who shall not be named, actually we should name her because she's probably gonna come up a lot. So I will take the liberty of representing uh, the person who I um, heretofore is, uh, um, uh, the worst legislator um, in the session, uh, 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 Representative Jane Gillette out of Bozeman. Um, let's talk, I can't wait to have conversations outside uh, the dome um, uh, about her. And I'm, and I'm watching Miha's um, comments in the chat. Absolutely, yes. Uh, attacks on LGBTQ and trans folks are absolutely reproductive health care attacks. And, and we are proud members of the Free and Fair uh, Coalition. Um, uh, so yes, let's let's you know be sure to keep BIPOC and LGBTQ folks in mind as we as we talk about these various attacks. So HB two two nine is um, a bill that will prohibit abortion coverage in um, health ex uh, exchange plans um, and uh, would make uh, low resourced people even it make it even more difficult for them to pay for their abortions. Uh, trap laws are targeted regulations of abortion providers. Um, uh, those are, you know, goofy, goofy laws, and you, they became trendy in, in the late 90s and, and early aughts that um, are very specific requirements for abortion providers that don't have anything to do with patient safety. Like, you know, the doors have to be a certain width. There was one trap law in the South, shocking, I know, that required the um, rooms of abortion um, healthcare centers to be painted a particular color. Why? That doesn't make any damn sense. Um, and that is a theme here. None of these bills do anything to increase patient safety. Uh, House Bill 136 is um, a 20 week ban, uh, particularly cruel as we talked about. Uh, um, some folks uh, don't even know that you know, something is potentially wrong with the pregnancy until after 20 weeks. Um, some tests just can't detect certain conditions. Um, one, at its core, 171 is um, a uh, telemedication abortion ban, which is critically important for folks living in rural areas um, and not in urban centers because it allows them to get their abortion meds by mail, which is amazing, literally meeting the patients where they are. Um, so telemed bans and, and uh, medication abortion ban. Uh, 171 would also require uh, healthcare providers to tell uh, patients that an abortion can be reversed, which is, it, that's junk science, that's a lie, can't they, uh, you know, they can't be reversed. Um, House Bill 140 uh, would require the offer of an ultrasound, um, which is offensive in, to, you know, that, and suggests that 
um, you know, women can't aren't making an informed decision uh, without the opportunity of an ultrasound. Um, 171 also requires multiple visits, which imposes, you know, ultimately imposes a waiting period. Uh, the last two are, um, uh, let me start with sex ed barriers. Senate Bill 99 would make sex ed in all of Montana opt in instead of opt out. And y'all can understand how that is so problematic uh, for students. Uh, you know, we, we, we aren't worried about the folks that can, you know, the students that can go home and have a conversation with their parents. The people we need to be watching for, for are those who cannot talk to their parents or their guardians and need this information. And it's not about the birds and the bees, although it is also, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's also about consent education and healthy relationships and HIV and AIDS, you know, information um, and making sure that folks are getting good information, peer-to-peer -peer education. Uh, that is a, um, a particularly harmful bill. And then last but not least, House Bill 167, um, this is, I'm sure, you, you know, you may have heard about it. This is uh, the quote unquote born alive bill. Um, this is, uh, 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 this is political theater. There's no other way to talk about this. This bill um, purports to be an update to existing law. Existing Montana law already requires uh, a medical professional to intervene in the event that um, an abortion goes awry. And, um, uh, is is you know just wicked in in um, exploiting families' pain. Um, these hearings have been particularly egregious and aggressive, and um, uh, and that's by design. And I could you know talk talk for you know for days about um, about the strategy from the other side to intimidate advocates like us, uh, but we will not uh, be silenced. Um, so I think the next slide is the last side slide, I will enunciate. Oh, so what if Roe fell? I will just take a quick moment on this. Um, green means that, um, <laughs> this is so awesome. It's like Sharpie gate. Uh, green means that uh, only good, only good if there is such a thing. Um, green means that uh, uh, their, the rights are protected, uh, pardon me, Green means that um, rights are expanded, which is um, amazing. Um, go east and west coast. Uh, yellow means that uh, rights are protected. Pink means that rights aren't protected. And then red um, means that the state is hostile, uh, which is a growing trend. More and more states are, are following red. The reason why Montana is listed yellow, so I um, should have forecasted for you that I was gonna uh, depress you and then hopefully bring you up at the end. Although no guarantee, um, our right to privacy in the Montana state constitution is stronger than that in the national constitution. So uh, when, not if, but when we litigate um, bad bills that are coming out of the legislature, uh, we are hoping that ultimately our state constitution um, will prevail and, uh, and, and protect access uh, to abortion rights. And then last, I, I don't know where Miha is going, but I wanna go with them. Um, and then the last slide, Hal. Uh, Great. So that bit.ly at the top um, is how to sign up for our weekly legislative newsletter, which will include information about all of these bills, um, how you can engage, including you know links to uh, reach out to your legislator. Our fabulous organizer, Julia Maxson, is on this call and does all the behind the scenes stuff to make sure that with the click of a mouse, y'all can uh, get in touch with um, the body that needs to be lobbied, whether it's the committee or the full uh, legislative body. Um, we put those weekly newsletters um, up on our website, uh, which is listed there. And then if we have, if you all have questions that we don't have a chance to get to today, uh, my email address is listed there. Oh, thanks Ella, super helpful. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much. Um, Heather, thank you so much as well. That was um, a very thorough, if at times slightly depressing, um, dive into both um, the budget and tax policy and what's happening on the repro rights front. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are just a touch um, over time based, you know, from our um, planned time frame. So I want to just um, see if 
there are any questions in the chat. I'm not seeing any that we want to address right up front. Um, if anyone has a burning question for either Heather or Laura, um, throw it in the chat right now. And um, we're going to, we'll take a couple minutes for those and then we'll just move straight into those breakouts. So we have at least 15 minutes to chat with one another in small groups. Um, all right, here is a question. If a bill is out of committee and you know your reps are voting the way you want, is it still worth contacting them? Um, if, or is the time spent better uh, writing to someone else? And if so, who? So we do know that the most impactful messages to legislators come from their constituents. So it's always actually good to contact your reps, even if you know they're voting the right way, because they're almost certainly hearing from folks on the other side. So go ahead and send that message. It's easy. Start there. Um, I would say, uh, remember that there's committees on both House and Senate side. So um, most bills haven't gone through both sides. If your bill, if the bill you're watching is out of the Senate or the House, then think about which committee it's going to in the other chamber, and you can send messages to that whole committee. That's the next thing that I would consider doing. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I would say you can always send a message to sort of targeted legislators, that is, legislators who might um, switch their vote, uh, especially on key committees. Um, and when you do that, I think it's worth taking a little bit of time to craft a message that is personal, because if you're not their constituent from their district, it does go a long way if you can say a little bit about who you are and why the issue impacts you. So that's what I would say in answer to that question. Okay. Um, I want to say that we're going to go ahead and move into our breakouts. What's going to happen here is